Listen only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this UCGIS webinar, where today we're going to be talking about the National Flood Forecasting and Inundation Mapping Program. My name is Diana Sinton. I am the Executive Director of UCGIS, and I'm very glad that you could join us today. We are going to be recording this session, and it will be available for <clears throat> review by anyone who's registered um, ahead of time, and we'll provide you with that recording link after the session. Your microphones are going to remain muted throughout this webinar, but if you have a question for either of the presenters, please type it into the question space, and we'll address those as we can during this presentation. At this point, I am going to uh, turn the uh, controls over to my colleague, Dr. David Maidment from the University of Texas, and um, you'll hear again from me a little bit later. Thanks. Thank you so much, Diana, and we really appreciate the opportunity to uh, present this webinar jointly between myself and Xiaowen Wang of the University of Illinois uh, to the UCGIS computer, uh, the UCGIS community. Uh, this concerns uh, the national water model and the role that CyberGIS is going to play in that. And so we want to, uh, this is in part uh, a collaboration with the National Weather Service. And the opportunity for this arises because the National Weather Service has established a new national water center on the Tuscaloosa campus of the University of Alabama. And that picture that you see there is not an artist's impression, it's a real building. Um, you may say, why Tuscaloosa? Well, thank you, Senator Shelby, whose hometown is Tuscaloosa. And this has given us an opportunity to really be able to think about hydrology in a new way at the continental scale for the United States because we've never had a national water center before. Uh, how this work for hydrology is done now is that there are regional river forecasts uh, centers that you see in this picture with different colors across different parts of the nation. And they forecast hydrology um, using averaged basin characteristics and they provide uh, weather forecast offices with forecast information about uh, stream flow and rainfall and so on. And there are 6,600 sub-basins in the continental United States that are forecasted in this way. Uh, what is happening is that the National Water Center has become established in Tuscaloosa and everything is being centralized at the National Water Center so that instead of having uh, 12 regional centers in the continental U.S. and one in Alaska, there will be a single national center with, uh, will be like the National Hurricane Center but will deal with flooding and other aspects of uh, water information. Uh, there was a meeting at the National Water Center in May of 2014, the first time the doors were opened, and I participated in that meeting. And I suggested to the group that was there, which included the National Weather Services Management from Washington and the regional centers, that if this were a, a pro project of the National Science Foundation, that it would be judged according to the criteria for transformative research that involve ideas, discoveries, or tools that radically change our understanding of an important existing scientific or engineering concept or educational practice, or leads to the creation of a new paradigm or field of science, engineering, or education and it challenges new understanding and provides pathways to new frontiers. And I asked the question, how do we move from evolutionary change to transformative change for hydrology for the nation? That led to something that came to be called the National Flood Interoperability Experiment that ran for a year from September 2014 to August of 2015. And this represented a partnership between the National Weather Service and the academic community uh, through the National Science Foundation and NOAA, which financially supported the effort. And last summer, a summer institute was held for 44 graduate students from 19 universities uh, from June the 1st through July 17th. Um, and it was a very successful event in inter-university collaboration. And really the purpose of this webinar is to invite the UCGIS community to participate in the equivalent event that we're going to have this summer. Uh, the goal of the National Flood Interoperability Experiment is to close the gap between national flood forecasting and local emergency response and to develop and to demonstrate forecasting of flood impacts at the stream and street level. So the National Weather Service is reaching down to the local level with a very high resolution uh, flood forecasting system and what we want to understand is how does the local folks reach back to the national level and close hands so that they can be properly informed uh, and have better flood emergency response. And 
GIS is an important uh, component of this, and specifically the NHD Plus version 2.1. And this is the geospatial hydrologic uh, framework for the United States. And it was built from the four national data sets that you see here, national elevation data set, hydrography data set, land cover data set, and watershed boundary data set that each individually took about 10 years to develop. And then the last 10 years after that's been spent on integrating them together so that now there are 2.7 million so-called reach catchments uh, for the continental U.S. And their average area is 3 square kilometers and the reach length is 2 kilometers. They are uniquely labeled so that each catchment yields just one, is linked to one stream as you see here. And that is now the definitive uh, land water connection for them for the nation. Here is one of these uh, reach catchments, and it just happens that this one is located near my home in Western Travis County in Texas. Uh, there was a sheriff's deputy who drove down that road that you see in the picture there at 2 o'clock in the morning last uh, September 2014. Uh, she was washed off that uh, low water crossing, and she did not survive. And there had already been raining there for two hours when she got there. Uh, that catchment is in the national data set. She had communications in the car. Uh, with a very good flood forecasting system and being communications, she, sh she should have got some warning that just said, dun, 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 don't go there. That's an example of the kind of death that's preventable, I think, with a better system. Uh, the national water model uh, is being computed now at the NOAA Weather and Climate Operational Supercomputer System, which is called WCOS, and it's going to become openly operational in June of 2016. It starts with a high-resolution rapid refresh forecast, uh, weather and forecast system that produces weather and precipitation forecasts that go into a land atmosphere model in a framework called WERF Hydro, which stands for Weather Research Framework Hydrology. That in, ten, that in turn produces runoff on the NHD Plus network, 2.7 million stream reaches for the country. And in the future, we would like to be able to translate that into flood inundation and impact and that's where we want to invite the UCGIS engagement with this process, because the first three legs of this stool are already created, but the fourth one is not. So what happened is that we've gone from the upper piece, the upper picture that you see here, which has 6,600 basins of average area of 400 square miles and 3,600 points where official forecasts are presented. The Blanco River at Wimberley is one of these places. Um, which is near uh, west of Austin, and in the new system that will be represented by 130 catchments and flow lines. There was a family from Corpus Christi uh, staying in a house on the Blanco River last May. Uh, they were washed away. The house had a bridge, and eight of the nine family members were drowned. And there's another example of how a better forecasting system and better flood information might have saved this family. Uh, the new system is going to have an average area of the catchments of one square mile, so it's going to be 400 times more spatially resolved than the existing system. So the National Water Model is going to become operational in June of 2016, and it's going to have four different uh, manifestations, as you see in this slide. The first one is called the Analysis and Assimilation Mode, which runs on an hourly basis uh, for three hours duration. Then there's a short-range projection, which is three hours of um, time step, and it runs for two days in extent. Then there's a medium-range projection, which has a daily time step and runs for 10 days. And then there's a long-range forecast that lasts for 30 days. And these have different um, weather drivers behind them. Um, all of them involve assimilation of USGS flow data to check the forecasts. And there's, at this point, 1,615 reservoirs that are incorporated into the scheme, although many more are needed to really make this uh, completely valid. Um, so there's already been a significant amount of flooding that happened in May of this year. And uh, one of my former students, Fernando Salas, who now works at the National Water Center, has prepared a couple of animations, one of the Mississippi River Basin and one of our coast here in Texas for the May flooding. So Diana, can you show us these animations now, please? So this is the first one uh, for uh, the Mississippi Basin. So this is about 3 million square kilometers. It has about 1.2 million reaches. Uh, you can see the simulation going on here. The colors represent the degree of extremity of the flood. 
um, as the rain clouds. This is actually a, a El Nino phenomenon, uh, but you can see uh, the network's been thinned a bit. You know, you don't see too much in the Missouri Basin, uh, for example, but uh, the water is um, uh, flowing throughout the network across the nation here. This is the uh, a storm that gave rise to very significant flooding in Texas and all and many other places as well. The colors represent uh, moderate, major, and extreme flood level, and these are formal definitions that the National Weather Service has for classifying the degree of extremity of floods. There's no actual formal inundation mapping here. These are just flow lines that are being colored in according to the degree of flood extremity. Can we go to the next one, Diana? And this one is a blow up of a bit closer version here of uh, the flooding in Texas. So the same kind of thing, the same sort of color scheme that you saw before, but you can see our main rivers and there's a lot more detail here uh, for the uh, flood situation in our state. And this was a major crisis for our state. Um, we had about 50 people drowned in this flood. Thank you so much. So I want to turn over now to my colleague, uh, Dr. Xiaowen Wang from the University of Illinois, and he's going to continue on and present to us the vision for the engagement of cyber GIS with the National uh, Water Model. Thanks very much, Dr. David Maidman. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. All right, so what I'm going to be talking about is the science and technology of cyber GIS for empowering the national water model as reviewed by Dr. Maidman. First of all, I want to acknowledge the federal agencies, NSF and USGS in particular, and also partnership with industry that have helped achieve the science and technology as I'll be sharing with you. In a nutshell, CyberGIS is the new generation of geographical information system that science deal with the challenges of big data through big compute approaches such as high performance computing as mentioned by Dr. Maidman, fostering large collaboration for solving complex prob problems such as based on the national water model. In a nutshell, CyberGIS represents a open architecture departing from the conventional monolithic architecture of GIS for integration across high performance computing, big data to knowledge transformation, high fidelity visualization and collaborative problem solving and decision making. And all of these elements are needed for enabling the national water model, the cases examples mentioned by Dr. Maidman. And essentially including the grand challenge as we learned from this flood or uh, water systems. There are a number of similar science drivers pushing for the geospatial discovery and innovation needed, enabled by advanced digital technologies. So CyberGIS essentially sits in the middle, representing this emergence of digital geospatial ecosystems that are bridging the digital divide. And from software point of view, we see this collaborative framework is needed, especially from geospatial lanes for handling big data challenges and empower high performance collaborative geospatial problem solving. And at the same time for this complex emerging geospatial digital ecosystems, this provides opportunity for us to understand the nature of such ecosystems. And there are three key modalities of our CyberGS software environment as summarized by this slide in the middle. At the bottom you see multiple representative advanced cyber infrastructure environments. GISoft middleware serves the purpose of integrated access to such advanced cyber infrastructure environments. And the CyberGS gateway serve the purpose of lowering the entry doors to very powerful CyberGS analytics such as needed by the national 
water model for the purpose of, for instance, getting the information to emergency responders in the flood cases. And the toolkit are the basic building blocks of CyberGIS in terms of the algorithms and the software that are able to take advantage of the massive computing power and the big data resources. So these are the basic building blocks of GISolve middleware. As you could see from the left, represent the computational intensity, how much requirement of computations needed for certain problem solving, such as computing the inundation maps to the high performance computing resources needed to make that happen. And uh, data and visualization, distributed analysis, imagine you would need many, many users access flood mapping information and how could you foster this information to be distributed through scientifically sound analytics and also collaboration and participation as we see large scientific communities are needed such as by the hydro community and the GIS community working together for solving complex problems as represented by the national water model. In terms of this evolving digital ecosystem, you could see here the popular commercial off-the-shelf ArcGIS Online is interoperating with CyberGIS Gateway, which I'll show you some examples later, but creating some holistic solution for data and computing intensive problem solving and the decision making. So the gateway essentially is an online system you could think of as uh, cyber GIS analytics in the cloud. And here, Tau Dim is an example, which is a, a software package originally developed by Dr. David Tarbleton at Utah State University. We're working with Dr. Tarbleton's group to make Tau Dim scalable to high performance and distributed computing resources for solving these large scale problems such as the national water model based flood inundation mapping. And uh, because it's online and it's meant to lower the entry doors to sophisticated cyber GS analytics, this does foster a global user community because users could register through online uh, environment such as a web browser. And you could see users distributed across the globe for accessing CyberGIS Gateway. And Toolkit, as I mentioned, essentially includes this uh, collection of software components, each of which is, in many cases, parallel scalable codes. And you could also see from the list, perhaps the uh, fonts are not so big here on this slide, but Tau Dim, for example, is included, and it's a current implementation based on MPI message passing interface, which is a parallel programming language. But there are also other software components based on some other parallel and distributed computing modalities, such as Hadoop or GPU. These are the very important elements, because traditionally, conventional GIS is built on sequential algorithms and computing logic. As now we see parallel, distributed computing is becoming the mainstream of computing architecture. We need serious effort to innovate the algorithms and the software tools to establish this new generation cyber GIS. Driven by software and unique requirements of geospatial discovery, such as the challenges presented by the national water model, we also need innovation for hardware and computing systems. And this cyber GIS supercomputer Roger is an example of that. It combines big data compute such as uh, Hadoop and Spark, and also conventional high-performance computing combined with graphics processing unit GPU, as well as cloud resource provisioning together for interactive analytics as needed, for instance, for uh, flood, flood mapping as a simple example. And this system integrates all of these elements in a holistic environment through this stack of tools and capabilities, and from the bottom at the level of advanced cyber infrastructure, you see different elements, including 
high performance computing, GPU based, as well as large memory and uh, large storage, high performance storage access based on solid state drive and the cloud on demand virtualization integrated together through CyberGIS software capabilities and services in the middle. And then a large collection of science drivers that are dependent on such geospatial computing and data capabilities. And again, we are very excited to see the scientific vision as uh, described by Dr. Maitman is uh, driving such innovation to uh, break through major uh, scientific barriers for the tremendous benefits we could see from the society uh, as well as uh, scientific advances. And there's also data element. We heard from Dave, Dr. David Maidman, there are multiple cases you see the combination of uh, very different geospatial data resources and this is across the scale and it's going to, for instance, uh, in the national water model case, the continental scale. And we clearly see the need for bridging between the spatial realm, considering various spatial characteristics and also the computational trade-off uh, across the scale. And this NSF project is uh, addressing this uh, scalable spatial data synthesis and it's uh, getting also implemented into cutting edge cyber GIS tools we hope to enable the national water model. So in the vision of cyber GIS, we see we are facing tremendous opportunities together with the challenges that is driving this integration with critical spatial thinkings needed from the very top of data intensive applications to the bottom of advanced cyber infrastructure innovation. And of course, this is uh, coupled with the tremendous digital transformation from the top, bottom to the top, and we see the opportunities of integration and synthesis using geospatial as common lanes to guide this integration and synthesis. And as you see on the right hand of this slide, the green color text represent some examples I touched upon, but we certainly did not have enough time to go into all of those, those details, but you see the general context of science and technology we are pursuing, especially for enabling the national water model and associated uh, flood mapping uh, experiment mentioned earlier. So last year, Dr. David Maitman gave uh, his keynote at the Cyber GIS All Hands meeting at uh, USGS. I'm quoting what uh, he said because this is uh, extremely exciting. It just uh, demonstrates uh, the uh, cutting edge aspects of cyber GS and what it could lead to in terms of the broad and deep societal impact. Now I'm going to cover a little bit of technical aspects. Uh, we are currently pursuing this uh, technical investigation coupling between cyber GS and HydroShare, which is uh, an SF project focuses on sharing uh, hydro data and models. And uh, as I was alluded to earlier, we see this emergence of geospatial digital ecosystems. And uh, in such ecosystem, CyberGS and HydroShare represent two entities we need to interoperate to achieve the kind of experiment such as NAFI National Flood Interoperability Experiment. And uh, below these two elements of the geospatial digital ecosystem, you see the cyber infrastructure, which includes the elements I was talking about from Roger, for instance, the CyberGS supercomputer. And you see these two systems, particularly CyberGS Gateway, is participating from the left side and HydroShare from the right side. And these two systems could interact together to achieve data sharing and analytics, and also the results get accessed by broad scientific and user communities, as you could see. For example, from the flood mapping point of view, you do uh, need to have a lot of users being able to benefit from the uh, information we, we need to produce in an emergency uh, response situation. So in the Tao Dim example I mentioned from the CyberGS gateway, uh, here are the URLs you could click. In fact, you could uh, click these links 
and you uh, are able to register yourself uh, by clicking uh, up right button on the CyberGIS Gateway front page. And if you get into the system after your registration, you would uh, see a similar interface as shown on this uh, slide, and you would be able to perform analysis against, for instance, this national elevation data, which is uh, one-third arc 10 meter resolution across the country, representing the terrain topographic variation across the U.S. continent. Now let's take this as an example, the NED data set, and perform top dim hydrological information analysis against such data set by clipping any part of this uh, a large terrain data set. And you will be able to zoom in anywhere you select, for instance, here is a part of Utah and Idaho, you would be able to select a small part of the terrain and then extract hydrological information which is categorized into multiple kinds of data products. On the left hand you could see some examples. If you select some of the data products, you would see on the right hand associated workflow for deriving such data products based on the NED national elevation data. The workflow serves the purpose of allowing broad scientific communities to understand what are the concrete steps of analyzing such topographic data sets so that we could uh, reproduce the same results for a broad dissemination of information such as flood information that needs to be accessed not only by scientists but also citizens. And you would be able to configure such workflow with the different parameters and each of those icons depending on the colors and the shapes, they refer to different meanings of the specific workflow steps. We could go into details uh, if we have time for questions. I'm going to jump through this uh, set of slides to, to show you if you commit such analysis because this is data intensive, generally you don't want to perform such analysis on your desktop computer GIS tools because it's not feasible and the computation is done here through the advanced cyber infrastructure resources largely supported by the National Science Foundation, in particular the Roger uh, CyberGS supercomputer I mentioned uh, currently is hosted uh, here at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications at Urbana-Champaign. And uh, here is an example of the result deriving stream, uh, work, uh, stream network flow, which is uh, essentially the base data Dr. Maidman was talking about in the national water model. Back to you, Dr. Minman. Okay, thank you, Shawin. So I was really excited. I, I sort of had in my mind when I gave the speech at the CyberGIS All Hands meeting that if there was somewhere we could gather together the national elevation data set and we could also uh, have a very large scale processing uh, activity that would involve TAUDEM or other uh, spatial analysis software, we could actually build a flood mapping application that would go along with the national water model. And I was really excited when I found that this could be done at the CyberGIS facility. So at the National Water Centre, we're going through an annual cycle of activities that involves a selection of candidates with students and faculty mentors. And what that means is that if a student goes to the, the Summer Institute, the faculty mentor gets to, um, a trip to go down to Alabama to see um, how the research is being formulated and to help with that. Then there's the Summer Institute, which takes seven weeks, and it's going to be uh, starting in the week of June 6th this year. There's a boot camp for a week. There's a research phase for about six weeks, and then there's a capstone event where the students present the results of, uh, of what they've learned. Then there's a publication phase uh, that there's this year a special collection of articles in the Journal of the American Water Resources Association that come from projects done at the Summer Institute, generally by three or four students working together. And then there's preparations for another large scale experiment. Uh, the one that we're doing this year is to build the flood inundation mapping that will support the national water model. I hope that next year we could do something about the national soil information, soil water information that underlies this and perhaps the following year dealing with national hydrogeology. But those are sort of plans for the future. So uh, 
what's going on is that the National Water Center has uh, its own supercomputer process and operations, and we in the academic community with uh, uh, QASI and UCGIS and so on have our own supercomputing facilities. So R2O means research to operations, and O2R means operations to research. In other words, we can take information back from what's actually going on in the National Water Center and use that for research purposes. Uh, in doing that, we've got six research themes that we're going to pursue in the Summer Institute. Uh, flood inundation mapping is going to be a big piece of this. Uh, we're dealing with indirect measurement of the water because if we're going to simulate flow in 2.7 million reaches of the country, we've got to do something other than just measure it with USGS gauges at 8,000 locations. We want to deal with data assimilation and forecast error because obviously on a huge thing like this, that's critical. We want to deal with flood emergency response. How do we translate this mapping into um, actionable intelligence for the fire and police and emergency response community? We want to deal with community case studies of how this will work in particular locations, and in particular how to integrate a national system like this with what's going on in the cities, like in uh, Philadelphia or San Antonio or Austin, Chicago, and so on. And then finally, uh, an emphasis on the continental water balance, because we're contemplating now hydrology at the continental scale in a way that we've never done before. We've really dealt with hydrology in real time, always just at the watershed scale before. So. Uh, there's a series of um, people involved in the Summer Institute that you can see here. I'm the technical director of it. Uh, Quasi has a course coordinator, Emily Clark. There are advisory faculty that are from Quasi institutions, and Jim, uh, Jonathan Nelson from the USGS is helping with that as well. There are theme leaders that have been drawn from different locations, including Albert Van Dyke from Australian National University is going to deal with the continental water balance. And there are student coordinators and assistants who will help with uh, working with the student groups. Uh, there's an application uh, process that goes on through QASI. Uh, QASI is the Consortium of Universities for the Advancement of Hydrologic Sciences. 125 universities belong to that. And if you go to this link here that says HTTPS uh, QASI.org Summer Institute, uh, you can get complete information about the program. Um, that includes uh, transportation and local expense uh, recompense for students who go to Alabama. It does not include a stipend. So this is, if a student participates, they have to participate on their own dime or the university, their own university supports them. Um, so to be eligible for this, you have to be a current or incoming graduate student or a postdoc within three years of completing the PhD. You must be enrolled in a US university. Uh, students who are not U.S. citizens have to report their visa status, and you have to participate in the program on site because uh, we don't want to have non-resident participants who are only there part of the time. Uh, there is an application uh, website in this thing called Proposal Space, and so basically you submit your whole application just by filling in boxes in this proposal space. Um, so what's needed is an application form, a statement of interest a CV detailing your education and research, a transcript of your uh, academic record, and a letter, letter of endorsement from the faculty advisor. And we really want to involve the advisors as much as possible in this process. What we learned out of the effort last year was that in order to have good papers that come out of the research that's done at the Summer Institute, it needs engagement by the advisor after the Institute is over so that we can bring forward the sort of research that's been developed into something that's really publishable. Uh, the deadline is soon. It's next Tuesday, March 15th uh, at midnight. So this is uh, one of these uh, short fuse things. It doesn't cost anything to apply, but uh, the deadline is very close. Uh, so the award includes a reimbursement of round-trip travel expenses, a room board at the University of Alabama, a program tuition and access to the instructors and materials, and travel support for the advisor to attend the boot camp or the capstone event so as to be involved in the effort as well. So that's, that's our story. So we want to welcome very much the UCGIS for the 2016 Summer Institute. I'm really excited about the uh, potential for connecting national water modeling with national geospatial analysis. And I think this is going to have pretty profound effects and impacts on the capacity of the nation to withstand uh, major flood events across large regions or even in, in local areas. So with that, I'll, that's the completion of our formal presentation, and we'd be happy to answer questions. 
Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, David and Xiaowen, for that presentation. So if anyone out there listening has a question about the information that's been presented, the Summer Institute, or anything about the model that's been developed or the Cyber GIS um, component of it, please feel free to type something into your question space um, or your, your it's a, I don't think it's called chat for you, I think it's called questions, but please feel free to do that and we'll be able to answer these questions right now. Diana, could you unmute May Wong? Y yes, I will. Um, uh, hey, hey. Hold on one minute. Let me... Uh, it's a little... Okay, May, I'm going to unmute your microphone right now. Hey, May, how are you? Good. How are you? David? Hey, Xiaowen. Good presentation. So Thank did you. you make any comments? Yeah, we've had some interactions, as you know, May, with uh, what's going on. Mm -hmm. How you see your center being involved in Dallas? Oh, uh, well, and Dr. Mayman was kind enough to get involved in the Texas group and try to look at the Texas uh, collaboration on the flood experiment. So we have meetings, uh, teleconferences among the uh, Texas, uh, University of Texas uh, system. Uh, we develop some idea that we want to look at a local scale of flood forecasting. Uh, for example, me and my uh, UTD, UT Dallas colleagues will look at uh, ways to develop uh, uh, the the, the elevation model, the uh, land use land cover data, along with the historical flood uh, records, and to look at the data simulation issues for the probability of different scale of flood events uh, distributed in the North Texas area. And we are also interested in looking at the real-time flood forecasting numerical model and see how we can uh, implement that model in the northern Texas area to look at the local flood situation and use the Texas, North Texas uh, watershed as uh, another experimental site to see how the uh, model performs. And But I, I think it's really exciting that uh, Xiaowen have the cyber infrastructure in place to support a lot of modeling activities. And I would think that that's a big boost for people do not have a, a very powerful computing server facilities to run the numerical model. And I think that it will be helpful if we can uh, use the North Texas data on the cyber infrastructure that Xiaowen has and then to see how the experiment can be at the local and regional level for the flood forecasting. So thanks, May. One of the things that really impressed me about the Cyber GIS facility was that it didn't have to just operate on the National Elevation Data Set. If we had higher fidelity LIDAR data locally, for example, you could put in that digital elevation model instead and then run the same processes on that and compare the result with what would happen if we used the National Elevation Data Set. Um, Diana, could you unmute uh, Karen Kemp? Diana, could you unmute Karen Kemp? I see Karen on the line there. Um, Karen was the person who really got me connected up with UCGIS, and I guess I'm going to come and give a talk at the UCGIS uh, annual symposium. Are you there, Karen? I hope I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you great. Do you have okay. any thoughts? Um, oh, well, I'm a little surprised. I was just sitting here quietly zoning out. Um, yeah, actually, this is um, it's really exciting to see this, to hear about the Summer Institute. Um, I'm sitting here pondering what wonderful students I can pull into this because it would be so cool to be part of this community. Um, and the reason I wanted David to speak at the, as one of our keynotes at the summer symposium is this: the, our theme at the symposium is the um, 
collaboration and transformative research. And there you have all the words just been spoken already. Um, our future as GI scientists really goes down this path. I think we've all known that we haven't done GI science in a vacuum. It's always been a collaborative thing, and all of us who are engaged with it see it as transformative. So it's it's nice to be able to step into a really big arena with everybody's attention all across the disciplines. This is just a fantastic opportunity, and I just hope that all of you people out there who have opportunities to um, get into the Summer Art Institute are frantically writing your applications now. It's a, it's a spectacular opportunity. I'm just thrilled. So we'll be going further down this conversation at the Summer Institute, or at the uh, Summer Assembly, indeed. Cool. Forward. OK, thank you so much, Karen. Diana, do we have other questions? No, we don't have any other questions that have come in right now. If anyone has just joined us, this is a chance to pose a question, either live, I'll uh, be brave and unmute your microphone, um, or feel free also to type something into the chat space. If you don't have any other questions now, also feel free, please, to check out the uh, uh, links that uh, David had posted before, and I will be sending all the registrants of this webinar a copy of those links again to be able to um, learn things more about the National Water Center and the Summer Institute and the Cyber GIS Center and all the great things we've talked about right now. Oh, there's can, a can question. You can you unmute uh, Shashi Shake? I, an old I, buddy of mine. I will unmute Shashi. First, I'm going to just mention that Janet Marsden has, um, we've had someone ask if they can get a copy of the slides at some point, and yes, we will um, uh, see about making those available as well. Shashi, heads up, you've been asked to be unmuted by our, um, here we go Shashi, I'm going to unmute you. Hey Shashi, how are you? Not quite sure he was uh, ready to be unmuted. He was <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Never invite David Maven to give a webinar when he's gonna. <laughs> before <laughs> warned everybody, you might you might get called out uh, to speak at, at, a, at a moment's notice as he scans through yeah, all the yeah. the great names we've got uh, here of people registered. Yeah, I've been on the Mapping Sciences Committee, and Shashi's been on it as well. That's how I know Shashi. So. Mm -hmm. Has okay. anybody else got any questions or comments? And that's, that's, again, fine if you don't right now. We know there's been a lot of information shared. Um, if uh, no one else has any questions right now, we'll just we'll wrap up this webinar. Again, uh, I will be sharing the link to its recording. Please feel free to distribute that among your networks who may be interested. If you know of any grad students or postdocs who might be interested in the um, Summer Institute, uh, please let them know. Deadline's coming up soon to apply for that. And uh, again, we very much appreciate your time. And thank you very much, David Maymet and Xiaowen Wang, for sharing all of this great information with us. So before we wrap up, uh, Diana. Uh, yes. May, are you still on the call? I suppose uh, feel free to get in touch with me with regard to your specific uh, computing and geospatial analytical challenges to deal with the Texas examples you mentioned. Okay, so May's responded. I, I, I've just muted again, but she's going to get in touch with you directly, Shawan. That sounds great. So that's May Yuan from UT Dallas, and um, we're glad that uh, she's going to be involved with this too. Okay, thanks everyone. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Pay attention, there's other UCGIS webinars 